Hello, thank you for listening to Psyche Design. My name is Megan Lavoda, And in this episode, I'm gonna be talking about how you are so much more than just your personality type. We're gonna talk about the concept of the self, what your personality type can tell you about yourself and your identity, but also some things that it can't cover and some things about you that are beyond that or just in a different category altogether. So there's a lot that I'm going to touch on in this episode, but it's not all encompassing. So if you have any ideas of something that I didn't mention, please leave me a comment. I'd love to continue the discussion. So first of all, to start this off, in talking about personality, there's this debate of what is nature and what is nurture. And if we're talking about Jungian personality type, so Jung's theory, Carl Jung's theory on cognitive functions and personality, um, the theory has it that this um, type is something that is innate. It is, comes from nature. And it's something that is an inherent pattern in how our consciousness operates. However, if we're talking about personality in a really broad sense of just um, the overall persona that you have, how you interact with people, um, what you identify with. Um, Personality in a broader sense most definitely is impacted by nurture. But this specific theory is very much trying to get at the nature part But the difficulty in this is that obviously how someone was nurtured, the experiences they had is most definitely going to influence the behavior, even some of inherent qualities or some internal qualities like your values, your worldviews, most definitely are going to be shaped by nurture. And so it's important to consider that the 16 personality type patterns that are based in Young's cognitive functions is only a small piece of the puzzle when it comes to personality type. For example, you may have heard of the personality type system, the Enneagram, that has uh, nine types that are based on a core um, core fear in an emotion that then bleeds into all of the behavior, and you can see these sort of coping mechanisms and patterns that we identify with and it is a part of our personality based on this core fear and any of the 16 Jungian types can be any of the nine Enneagram types so you could have any sort of combination to where on an emotional level your core fear and coping mechanisms that influence behavior might be one way but your main way of processing the world in a cognitive level could be a completely different way. So most of what I talk about in this podcast and on my YouTube channel is about Carl Jung's theory of personality where there are eight building blocks of cognition or types of consciousness. And something that I think is really important to focus on when we're talking about this is that it's all mental. It's all happening in the mind. And Something that makes it really hard when we're trying to measure personality type is that with Jungian personality type, um, you can't just look at the behavior in order to tell what someone's type is. Because the groupings of the 16 patterns are based on, they, they originate in the mind and it's based on a cognitive motivation for the behavior. So any behavior could have uh, any of the functions as a root for what inspired that behavior. So in order so in order to really even know what someone's uh, personality type pattern is in the system, you're going to need to make sure that you're understanding the core root and motivation of that behavior. And you're not just looking on the surface when it comes to traits and behaviors. And part of the reason why, um, if you've ever heard of the popular Big Five personality system, it's very popular in uh, mainstream psychology. This is a trait-based system, which means that 
um, any person can have any combination of traits and those traits have actually been studied to show that they influence behavior. Because traits are more of a combination of nature and nurture rather than purely something that's innate. There's a level of choice there and your traits are going to uh, change depending on, uh, you know, your development or where you are, uh, what your character looks like at that time. And so when we're talking about traits, we're looking at a higher level in the psyche than something that is uh, more of a deep root level. And so it's so much easier to notice and tie together traits and behavior. Traits influence behavior in a way that, that's just easier to measure. And so part of the reason why the big five is popular is because in psychology, if we're trying to understand what makes people tick and we wanna understand and predict what their behavior is, then knowing their traits is gonna be really useful. The thing is, is that people's traits can change over time. And we know this. Uh, we know that people change over time and that's why there's such a resistance to, that's why people feel a resistance to wanting to fit themselves into a system of just 16 types. But the thing is, is that because the 16 types are looking at these core patterns that are, in my opinion, like deeply entangled with the soul of the person, um, it's harder to see on the surface because the pattern is showing if you have a tendency toward extroversion or introversion, feeling or thinking, sensing or intuiting. And when you have a tendency for something, that doesn't mean that you can't uh, go in the other direction. And so in my opinion, in order to really know what someone's type is, you have to really look at their story over time. You can't just look you can never just look at how someone is behaving in this exact moment. But when you look at someone's story over time and you understand their uh, character arc, how they got to where they are now, what they've always struggled with, what the common obstacles have been and where they're headed, you can really start to see these tendencies play out and it becomes so much clearer to see um, all right, this person definitely has a tendency toward thinking, or this person has a tendency toward feeling. But at any given moment or any given context, a person could be doing either or. And so that's why it is really difficult to measure because you could develop a trait um, in one area that, or, uh, or you see what I mean. Um, so because your type is dependent on your journey over time and it's looking at that core thread beneath all of the behavior, your personality type in a Jungian sense isn't going to predict your behavior at all. There's an element of choice in which you have the power to choose your behavior. And then there's also um, aspects um, from your culture or from your development or how you were raised, stuff like that that can influence uh, your behavior. And so Linda Behrens, who is a typology expert, uh, she talks about the concept of there being a core self, a developed self, and a contextual self. Whereas that core self is something innate, and that's where your type pattern could be found from that core self. Then you have the developed self, which could include traits that you have developed or any aspect that of your identity that you have worked on and incorporated into your personality. And then the contextual self is situational. It's based on what's going on at that specific moment and how you choose to respond to it. So I want to talk about some other things that are going to influence the way their personality type shows up, but also 
going back to the idea that you're more than your personality type, I want to just talk about how many things and how many layers of things make you you that personality type absolutely can't uh, describe. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, trauma, which kind of goes hand in hand with your specific childhood upbringing. Uh, that's something that I think um, most of us probably agree on, but I don't know if it's talked about enough or considered enough when we're trying to understand uh, what our personality type might be or how to type other people, which the reality is this isn't how we should be using type four, or this isn't what we should be using type four because um, there are certain things that can happen to a person that is so influential to someone's behavior that I guess completely different types might be acting in the same exact way because they had a shared experience, for example. And we are very malleable as humans in the sense that things that we experience really leave a mark on our psyche when it comes to trying to make conclusions about the world around us and who we are. And um, while your personality type pattern might show you a tendency of what type of information you might be considering about what's happening, the event that's happening is going to influence you on all angles in the sense that for me, for example, I have a preference for intuition, but if an event happens to me, it's not gonna just influence me intuitively. It might also influence this sensing side to me. And maybe I'm gonna process uh, it conceptually and feel comfortable with that, but maybe I won't process um, certain sensory things. Maybe I'm gonna process my emotions from a feeling side of things, uh, ask myself if I was acting ethically, but maybe I won't process uh, some of the thinking side of things. It doesn't mean that it's not, that this event is not going to influence the way that I think or the way that I am in a sensory way. And um, I think that's important to realize that um, we have these tendencies and certain blind spots of like some information we might just not pick up on or we might not feel responsible for processing, but it's still happening, even if it's happening in the shadow. I definitely know that there have been things that have happened to me that have changed some of my more sensory behavior and the way that I embody myself that I had no clue was a change that was happening to me. Um, trying to think of an example, I'm gonna kind of segue to this other thing. So mental health and uh, disabilities is another thing that is going to influence the way that someone's type is going to show up and is also going to play a big role in your overarching personality, how, how you um, engage with the world around you. And what I was going to bring up is that I um, have been diagnosed with ADHD and that um, happened early this year in 2021. But when I realized kind of looking back, there's been a lot of um, things in the sensory world and in the sensing side of things, I guess, that have been maybe signs that I had ADHD or ways in which that I reacted to the sensory world that I wasn't really aware of because it wasn't something that I was really focused on processing, but it still was influencing my behavior. And that's just kind of one example of how that can come up. And ADHD was just one mental health example, but any thing that you like mental health or disabilities or like any sort of physical condition as well, anything that you're 
dealing with is going to influence the way that you as a human are going to be processing the world around you. And I guess kind of going along with the childhood upbringing thing that I was saying earlier, there's, we're all, no matter, no matter how we were raised, it, we're going to be put in situations at some point in our life in which other functions that are not preferred to us are going to feel a little bit of pressure. We might feel challenged or challenged or pushed to go into certain areas that we might not feel comfortable. And I think that for some people, this might happen more than others. And um, that's kind of just how it is depending on, so going back to the childhood upbringing, depending on how you were raised, the types that raised you and the biases that they have, of what kind of teachers you had, things like that. Um, you are going to learn, like so much of what we learn about how the world works comes from the people that raise us. And um, we might, some, some of us might have been forced at a very young age to uh, distrust our natural tendencies, where some have had our natural tendencies really enforced uh, positively to continue doing that. And we're going to feel like whether it happened early in your life or later, there comes a time in which you're going to be in a situation in which a function that is not as preferred for you is going to feel the pressure and you might have to rise to the occasion. And that's kind of what I mean when I'm talking about the context and the situation at hand that might require uh, certain functions over others or maybe some information that you might not prefer to process or might not be a tendency for you to consider might kind of slap you in the face and show up on, my, on your lap and you kind of have no choice but to look into it. Because while different types have their different cognitive blind spots, it's not like we're incapable of perceiving these things. The, the functions that are more in the shadow or not as much of a tendency for us, are they're going to maybe be slower for us to process and take more energy. But we're not incapable of putting ourselves into a different mindset for uh, the time being if, if it's needed and if we're feeling enough pressure. So on that note, I wanted to talk about class and privilege because the amount of resources that you have is going to definitely show, or it's going to definitely impact your attitude toward functions that are not necessarily as preferred for you. Um, if you have less resources, then you're, you might feel like you kind of have no choice but to dip your toe into other functions. Like if you're an intuitive, for example, and you literally have to do a lot of chores around the house or I don't know, like there's kind of a stereotype that like intuitives can't do things in the physical world, but when you are needing to stay alive, then yeah, you're gonna do what you gotta do. Um, on that note, I have talked with a few um, people about the idea of uh, like blue collar workers and trade workers. A lot of times people might assume that an intuitive type wouldn't be gravitating toward those jobs or wouldn't exceed or wouldn't excel at those jobs when that is kind of unfair and not true. I know an ENFP who has primarily worked in uh, trades because his family um, primarily works in trades and that's, he just comes from a blue collar family. And so that's what was expected of him. And so that's what he did. And he works hands-on and does things uh, physically because the, that's been the job that was available to him. And I think that that's an important thing to consider if we are trying to figure out what someone's type is. You can't just look at what their job is and assume that that says something about their type because the amount of privilege and resources that they have is going to 
influence that. So kind of on that note, well, actually, before I go there, I want to talk about culture and how that also has to uh, do with uh, privilege. So the culture that we grow up in is going to have a huge, huge impact on the types of information that we naturally feel compelled to pick up on. And even within each of the functions, in, in, uh, you might have a specific attitude or resistance toward that. So I know a lot of people talk about culture in the sense of that some cultures or countries might have preferences for certain functions over others, which is definitely the case. Um, whereas um, the U.S. might be more of a TE type of society. I've heard a lot of people make the case that like, um, like a lot of the Latin uh, cultures, so like Hispanic or um, Italian, Mediterranean, that a lot of those might be more FE based. And that definitely could be true. But another element of culture I want to bring up is the fact that it's not just that certain cultures have preferences for cer certain functions. Certain cultures have ways in which they express that function. So it's almost like the function itself is being expressed through a cultural filter. At least that's how I've been thinking about it. Because if FE, for example, is a function that's focused on uh, the emotional considerations um, on a mass scale and uh, wanting to communicate that freely, those, the social norms that they're going to be picking up on are going to be different based on the culture and the values are going to be different too. And so the ways in which you would consider all of the emotional implications in the best way of doing that and how that looks to the person viewing it is going to be different based on the culture that that person is in. And so cultural values also are underlying as well. So not only is it something that is a filter that your function expresses through, but it's also um, a core value that you might not even realize you have. Um, for example, I know in a lot of Western countries, there is a strong core value of productivity where a lot of people really measure their value as a person up against how productive they feel or how much money they're making or things like that. And not all cultures see it that way and value that to the same extent. And that might be something that every type that's raised in a um, Western culture might uh, be grappling with. And even if you don't value that, you'll still maybe feel the pull of the fact that it is so valued. So that's definitely gonna influence um, how, you, how things come up. Um, and privilege going along with that is going to depend on uh, your demographics and the amount of uh, privilege that the culture that you live in um, allows you or, and, and that's going to be different based on the person and where they're living and who, who they're around and also the structural systems that are in place in that uh, country or city, whatever. Um, it like, is there equal opportunity, which kind of goes along the lines of how many resources do they have? And also even within a subculture of their race or gender, that subculture might have specific norms and a cultural understanding in which their function will also be filtered through as well and expressed uh, will be expressed differently based on that. So I want to talk about interests and in industries because earlier, whenever I was mentioning that the ENFP, as an example, who um, has, works in a trade job. So your industry that you work in and the culture of that and is going to also really, really influence the things that you value, the things that you pick up on 
and a lot of your behavior because um, there's certain parts of your brain that you might be working all day while you're at, at your job. And um, I think it's important to realize that not only can every type do any job, like different types might have preferences in one way or another, but each job is likely going to um, need people of all different types in order to, I guess, have a well-rounded understanding of the a best way to do that job. Like there's not one way to get the job done. And each of the 16 types is just one way of like processing the information uh, that is then required to get the job done. But the, the social norms of that job or, um, and, and values, but also just what is your brain literally doing all day? That's going to influence the way in which you communicate and how you come off that may or may not look similar to the stereotype of your personality. And I believe that Dario Nardi, who is a personality expert and a neuroscience researcher, um, when he looks at um, the brain scan of the different personality types, yes, there is a theme where you can see the personality types in the data, but the industry that someone works in and also their age is going to be very impactful. I believe he said that the industry is even more impactful than type. Um, I would need to double check on that, but I know that that's very, very impactful to where two people that work the same exact job but are different types might have very, very similar brain wiring because their brain is thinking the same types of things and having to complete a similar type of task um, all the time. So I know for me, I have had to do a lot of statistics and data analysis for my job. And um, working, I have an undergrad in journalism, and I feel like journalism is very focused on telling the truth and making sure that everything, everything that you're saying is backed up in like fact and that you can source everything. And I feel like if I didn't have my journalism experience, I would be speaking a lot more in a flowery way. But a lot of that got beaten out of me in journalism school with the idea that nobody cares, nobody cares. You have to explain yourself in a way that is gonna make sense to everyone. And you have to, um, you can't just say whatever you think sounds nice. You have to, um, you know, make sure that you aren't spreading any sort of misinformation. And so that's always been a big thing to me to where um, I think that that definitely, I think that that experience has made me maybe use more sensing and thinking in the way that I communicate. Um, and so I also wanna talk about just general opinions and worldviews and values, which this could be something that you come up with on your own, but it also could be influenced by your family. So this could be political, this could be a philosophy. Um, that is going to really influence the way in which your type pattern is expressed. And even the types of information that any cognitive function is going to be focused on. So for example, extroverted feeling, um, if you're thinking about what's best for the whole group and considering everyone's emotions. Some of those people are going to be like left on the political spectrum and some are going to be on the right. And their idea of what is considering everyone's emotions and what is being helpful and creating harmony, whatever, is going to be completely different depending on their worldview. And same goes with extroverted thinking. 
whether you're on the left or right, like what you think is fact is going to be different based on what facts you're looking at and what your general opinions are in life and what your values are and what you prioritize. That is a huge part of who you are. And I think out of all the things I've mentioned, the people that I get along with the, the most share a similar worldview and values to me and also have similar interests to me, no matter what their type is. And so whenever I was saying the industry you work in, I also want to point out your interests and hobbies can have a similar effect. If you have been an artist for several years, that's also going to influence the way that your brain works and also what you gravitate toward. How you want to spend your time is going to influence things a lot. And I, again, like you can argue that type might interact with what your worldview is and what your interests are and how you choose a job and what industry you want to work in, but different, like someone of any type could put themselves in any of these positions or could have been raised in a certain way in which they end up in one of these uh, positions. Because another thing that I wanted to mention is desires. Your desire in life, and this also can be maybe connected to your destiny, is absolutely going to influence your behavior because you might, you might want a really public-facing job, you might want a private life, you might want to travel a lot, you might want to uh, create art, you might want to be a writer, you might want to be an athlete. There's a lot of things that you might want to do with your life, which is kind of falls in line with interests. But at the end of the day, if you have enough desire behind wanting to accomplish something, then you might figure out how to make it work, whether or not, whether or not it is something that comes supernaturally to you. Because I think every, I think everybody has certain desires that are a bit of a challenge and is going to require uh, you to stretch yourself a little bit. I think most pursuits are going to probably require you to dip your toe into probably all of the functions to some extent. Um, like I know for me, like I would, I'm working toward being self-employed. I want to practice psychology. I want to share philosophy. I want to do like coaching and writing and I also want to have time to make music, which there's a lot I want to do. Um, but in order to actually do all of that, I'm going to need to make sure business systems are in order. I'm going to need to talk to um, someone to help me with my taxes. I'm going to need to come up with a business strategy. I'm going to need to do a lot of stuff that um, I don't necessarily want to do, but are required in order for me to do what I want to do. And so if what you want to do, your desire is pushing you to figure out some other things that might be uh, not ideal for your type pattern and you do it and you do it enough times and you're going to get used to doing that and it's not going to be scary anymore. And that's going to influence your personality as well because if you do if you do that after a while, it might, it's going to influence what your comfort level is and there might be certain types of information that you're used to seeing and you're used to dealing with. So for me, I'm really used to writing about tech because I, my first job in journalism, I had to interview a lot of tech startups and I had to ask a lot of questions about how gadgets work. And at first I was pretty intimidated because there's all these random components and I didn't understand anything. And I asked enough questions. I understand the gist of how that landscape works and I'm not intimidated at all by by technology. So like, and I, at first I'm like, my brain doesn't really work this way. Like this seems like very mechanical and like robotic. And like, I just want to ask people like what they're passionate about and what inspired them to start this thing. I want to figure out their why and like get some good sound bites. It's like, I, I was more naturally focused on maybe more of the emotional side of the communication, but Eventually I had to get really comfortable with the other side because it was required. So 
that's just one example. And, um, and also your desire in life might, sometimes your desire might line up really perfectly with your, um, with your type pattern in like a stereotypical way. And that's great. Sometimes it won't like, I've known INTPs who desire to be a healer. I've known um, ENFPs who desire to be a um, like a researcher and like scientific. And you know, these things though, they're not outside of the bounds of the personality type whatsoever. They might just be outside of our stereotype of what the type is but it's not outside of the capabilities of the type because no matter what your type is, no matter who you are, we all have to get out of our comfort zone. Whether we like it or not, we've been in a situation in which we've had to. So even just simply going through the schooling system and trying to date people is probably enough. Like if you've been on one date before, if you've gone to like a class before, you've probably had either an assignment that was pushing you in some area where you're like, I don't actually think this way. Or like, maybe you've gone on a date where someone thinks really differently than you, or maybe you've gotten into a disagreement with a partner um, or someone that you were interested in and you just weren't seeing eye to eye. Like this happens all the time to everyone. And so we shouldn't be thinking about our type as something that's going to limit what our capabilities are, because we have to go outside those bounds all the time. So really at the end of the day, your worldview and your life philosophy and values, and also how well you stick to your integrity and your character is going to influence your behavior so much more than type. And ultimately, I think that it defines who you are so much more than type. So on the note of integrity and character, it's like, it's one thing to understand your values and your priorities. And it's another thing to choose to stick to them, no matter what, even when it's hard. And I think that the people that do choose to stick to that, even when it's hard, are the sort of people that are choosing to go outside of those comfort zones. And they've probably gotten a little bit comfortable with certain areas that might not have been comfortable to them naturally, or might not have been a tendency. And so like, just as an example, like as a a feeling type, it is more natural for me to want to connect with others and hold space for others and provide support. And it's very difficult for me to say no and set my boundaries because I don't want to make anyone upset. But in order for me to actually stick to my integrity, I have to learn to say no. And I have to learn to honor my energy levels and also um, be honest with the people I'm talking to. So it's like, I personally think it's kind of a maturity thing as well to recognize that this other tendency has its time and place. And whether you know your type or not, like I think that most people realize on some level that there's a time and place for feeling and thinking, sensing and intuiting, extroversion and introversion. And I think that because most people kind of know that, it can also be hard for some people to figure out their type because they know that they can prioritize these things, like depending on the day or the situation. When um, really um, the best use of type in my opinion, is just as a way to check yourself when you and how you naturally approach a problem or a situation. And what is the information that stands out to you immediately? And what do you tend to gloss over? And if you're aware of what you tend to focus on more, then if you do want to be a little bit proactive about the things that might trip you up, it helps to just open your eyes a little bit more to the whole picture of everything that you could, all of the types of information you could be picking up on. You don't have to, because 
uh, like I said, there's going to be situations in which you have to use certain functions that are out of your comfort zone and it does take more energy and effort. And so you shouldn't be putting the pressure on yourself to be like a superhuman and use all eight functions all the time, because that's going to be really exhausting. So it also can help to, if you do understand your preferences in that department to um, make decisions in your life based off of what is going to be a little bit easier for you. Um, a couple other things. So Enneagram, I did already talk about that, that that's another element of how your personality will show up. Also your attachment style, which is kind of connected to childhood. This um, has more to do with your uh, relationship with your parents growing up and how you learned to express your needs, whether or not you're more likely to be anxious about attachment and codependent, or whether or not you're more likely to be avoidant of intimacy. So how you respond to intimacy could definitely, like any combination of that with any combination of type and Enneagram, and then not to men mention astrology. So I personally believe in astrology. Um, it is not um, it's not a psych it's not like a psychology in the sense that type is a theory on psychology, but in my opinion, astrology is uh, wider and broader than type, where your chart describes not just your general energy, but your general life story, to where um, the different planets and what houses those planets are in. It's going to tell the whole story of your life. So not just you, but the people that you interact with and the situations that you have. So your astrology chart is probably going to show more of your developed and contextual self as well, which is one of the reasons why, among many reasons, why it's difficult to just know what someone's type is based on their astrology chart. I personally think that if you know your type and you've gone through that self-discovery process, then you can definitely find connections in your natal chart and kind of see where that lives. But you can't look at the astrology chart and then decide what someone's type is. So, but your general astrological energy, so whether or not you're more of an earth heavy person or an air or fire or water heavy person is also going to influence the ways in which you express through those cognitive functions. So the way that I think about this is that your functions that exist in your mind are filtering through culture. And that's something that's external to you and your functions are filtering through that culture and how they're expressed. If we think of your astrology chart as talking about your general energy, then that is the energy that is then embodying the cognitive function and then being filtered through the function. So I don't know if that makes sense. That's just how I personally think about it. So I rattled off a lot of different factors and I know there's definitely more. So like I mentioned, please comment if there are any that you uh, can think of that you thought that I missed. Um, I want to do this video to continue the conversation around what type is for and what it's not helpful for. And hopefully this episode has helped you to understand a little bit of all of the things that can influence the way that you show up in the world that your personality type can't uh, really dictate for you. And so that's one of the reasons why there's gonna be a lot of differences within one same uh, personality type pattern. You might share the same cognitive preferences, but your behavior might be completely different. You might have different opinions on things. You might have different interests. You might have core desires. And um, yeah, so uh, I guess that's it. I could talk forever about this, as I mentioned. But um, thank you so much for listening to this episode. And uh, yeah, I look forward to chatting with whoever in the comments if you have any other ideas on this.